Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. If you've been watching these videos in order the last few days, you may have figured out that I am currently working on profiles of Confederate soldiers with Maryland connections. And that's the case here. His name is James Perrin Crane, and he lived in Baltimore for most of his life. I started researching his story today, and I put together a number of sources to try to tell the basic story of his military service. And so in this episode, I want to share with you the resources and what I learned from each one to be able to tell that fuller story. Now, my work isn't complete yet. I have a lot of double checking and confirmation to do, um, but I've gathered most of the main references. So my first stop was the Civil War database. And here I learned that he was born in 1838 in St. Mary's County, Maryland, lived a long life, died in 1916, also in St. Mary's County, and he is buried there. In 1861, he was a 22-year-old student giving his residence as Great Falls, Maryland, and he enlisted in July 20th, 1861 at Charlottesville, Virginia as a captain. Well, that pretty much tells us that he was a student at the University of Virginia. So I went to the Encyclopedia of Virginia to find out what I could learn about his enlistment. And sure enough, there was at least four companies of volunteers that were raised from the campus. The fourth company was called the University Volunteers. And they were organized in April or May with 65 men and their captain, James Perrin Crane. On August 13th, just a couple of weeks after the first Battle of Bull Run, the University Volunteers became Company G of the 59th Virginia Infantry. The regiment was only together for a few months, a short enlist enlistment. In December 7th, the regiment was disbanded so students could join other regiments who were from outside Virginia. Now, back to the Civil War database. In the summer of 1862, Crane joins Company B of the 2nd Maryland Infantry. So he's one of those University of Virginia students who benefited from the dismantlement of their company to join their home states. So here we have Crane back in his native Maryland in the 2nd Infantry. He is a good soldier, goes from captain to major, and he has a long list of various statuses, absent, sick in Richmond in October, wounded at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on the second day of fighting, wounded in August at August 1864, in the fighting at the Weldon Railroad, the wound in his left arm and leg, he is hospitalized in Richmond. He's furloughed in November of 1864. Just a few months later, he's captured at Hatcher's Run, Virginia, exchanged in March of 1865. And just a couple weeks later, he's in Richmond and is captured a second time signs the Oath of Allegiance in May of 1865. So if you do the math, wounded twice, captured twice during his war service. <clears throat> the military service record for parents, uh, for Perrin Crane, is has an interesting entry. There is a record, a hospital record, that dates from August 18th. That's the Battle of Weldon Railroad. And it says that he suffered partial paralysis in his left arm and leg. That gets back to that wound described in his other record. But it adds a curious detail. The wound caused partial paralysis 
from the blow of a musket over his spine. That leads one to believe he was hit with a musket. Another report in a publication called Civil War in the East says for the 18th of August to the 19th of August at the Weldon Railroad that Captain Crane was killed. That turns out to be a false report. You students of the Civil War know that reports of soldiers being killed in battle only to turn up alive. I don't want to say it's fairly common, but it does happen more often than you might think. Now, you may be curious what happened to Crane at the Battle of Weldon Railroad, and what was the Battle of Weldon Railroad all about? So let's go back to the Encyclopedia of Virginia that has a very concise account, and it says, Major General Governor K. Warren, Union General, led his Fifth Corps west from the Union lines located south of Petersburg, Virginia, on a steamy August 18th. His lead division reached the railroad around Globe Tavern about nine o'clock in the morning and began to destroy the tracks, opposed only by a weak body of cavalry. General PGT Beauregard, the ranking Confederate officer at Petersburg, while Lee directed affairs north of the James River, sent three infantry brigades early in the afternoon to dislodge Warren. The Confederate attacks halted Warren's advance up the railroad, but did not drive him away. Warren deployed his entire corps to cover the railroad, leaving a gap between his right flank and the established Union lines to the east. Now, how many times have you heard both Union and Confederate armies, corps, brigades leaving gaps in the line? Well, here we go. Here's another one. Into that gap on August 19th, the second day of the Battle of Weldon Railroad, plunged three Confederate brigades led by Major General William Mahone, while more Confederates pressed Warren's front. Mahone smashed one Fifth Corps division and pressed the next one in line until reinforcements from the Union's Ninth Corps halted Mahone's progress. The Confederates, the Confederates captured more than 2,500 enemy soldiers on August 19th and killed or wounded nearly 400 more, but their victory fell short of recovering the critical railroad. Now, the last account to fill in the details of Captain Crane and the 2nd Maryland Infantry during the two days of battle is covered in a wonderful book that I highly recommend. It's called The Maryland Line in the Confederate Army, 1861 to 65. It's written by W.W. Goldsboro. That's William Worthington Goldsboro, who was very involved in the Confederate military history of Maryland. Crane was in command of the 2nd Maryland Infantry, which gives you some sense of the command structure. You've got a senior captain command at the battle. And here's a description of the involvement of the 2nd Maryland Infantry in the battle. It starts Thursday, the 18th of August, 1864, found the 2nd Maryland Infantry then attached to Archer's Brigade, Heath's Division, A.P. Hill's Corps, bivouacked in a little valley about 100 yards wide, the hills on either side crowned with a few stately pines and a bold stream coursing through the center. We had only a short time before being relieved from the trenches and were congratulating ourselves on the prospect of rest. Near midday, we heard the boom of artillery away around on our extreme right. Then slowly and solemnly another boom and then another. Soon, the drum beat the assembly. Right face, forward, march was the command. And off we went to the Weldon Railroad. A whole column marched southward on the track. A piece of artillery unlimbered in the road and fired down it, betoking danger ahead. 
we soon filed off to the left, Davis's brigade to the right, and formed a line on either side and at right angles to the railroad. In a short time, the two brigades received orders to advance. As we emerged from the woods, the view that presented itself was an open space nearly level about half a mile wide with a forest on the southern side. When half across the enemy commenced firing, onward we moved, our line being bent like a bow, the second Maryland well up front. When scarcely 200 yards from and in the immediate front of the enemy's line of battle, we came to a lane with a fence on either side. We climbed these fences in the face of the enemy fire, and why they did not ruin us, I have never been able to understand. Still, we pushed on, firing all the time. As we entered the woods, we came upon 50 or 60 killed and wounded in our battalion front. We drove the enemy back easily and advanced several hundred yards into the woods. On the enemy threatening right flanks, we fell back to the line from whence we had first driven them. The enemy attempted to charge us, but a few well-directed volleys drove them back. While this attack was being made, a new brigade was brought up and laid down in our rear. We felt proud as we heard their officers say to their men as they pointed to us, look how those men are standing up to their work. After this attack had been repulsed, we moved to our left to support to our skirmish line, which had been holding the enemy's line of battle in check. We remained there until eight or nine o'clock at night when we left our skirmish line and fell back to Petersburg. We had but three brigades engaged and the enemy's much larger force as they overlapped our flanks. The night was dark and damp. We kindled our fires, roasted our corn, and lay down on our wet trappings and wrappings for a night's rest. So there's the first day of the battle from the perspective of Crane's 2nd Maryland Infantry. The writing, the narrative, continues to get into the next day. But severe as the first day's fight on the Weldon Railroad, the little battalion, that's the 2nd Maryland, was to go through a still more trying ordeal the next day when more of the heroic band, already reduced to a handful of brave men, were to disappear from the ranks, alas, many of them forever. On that day, August 19th, General Lee determined to make another attempt to regain possession of the Welton Railroad. Again, it was a portion of A.P. Hill's Corps that was ordered to the attack. The route taken on the 19th was the same as that of the day before, and through a drenching rain, the troops moved steadily to meet the enemy. <coughs> line of battle, excuse me, line of battle was formed just as it had been on the 18th and upon nearly the same ground, breastworks, more numerous now, even and stronger than the day before, were to be stormed. The ground was unfavorable for attack, and it was apparent to all that the day was to see some hard fighting, but with little prospect that success would crown the Confederate arms. Skirmishers were thrown out, and the heavy line of battle moved forward to meet the enemy. It was not long before the irregular fire of the skirmishers in front gave warning that the work had been cut out. Forward, double quick was the command, and the line of battle swept on with beautiful precision, and the enemy in heavy masses were met on the edge of the wood. The spattering fire of the skirmish line had now changed to one continuous roar of musketry, and brave men on both sides fell by hundreds. The enemy was driven back, and the first line of works were soon in the hands of the Confederates. Archer's brigade, to which was attached the 2nd Maryland, captured the 2nd, and afterward the main line of works, but the supports on the left were unable, or, through someone's blundering, did not get to the breastworks where the little brigade was battling with an overwhelming force. For an hour, 
this unequal contest was waged when Colonel Christian, in command of the troops in possession of the fort, ordered the second Maryland to be thrown obliquely to the right and form line, which movement had hardly been performed when the enemy came on in heavy force with bayonets fixed and not firing a shot. The battalion poured a heavy fire into them, which staggered them for an instant, but they still pressed on until they had reached the fort. Here, a hand-to-hand -hand conflict ensued the Confederates on the inside trying to retain and the Federals on the outside trying to regain possession of the fort. But this unequal contest could not long continue for the Federals soon swarmed into the works where for a while the fight was continued, the survivors then trying to fight their way out. Some succeeded, but one third of that gallant band of Marylanders lay dead and wounded or were prisoners in the hands of the enemy. Many were the noble spirits who fell in those two days of desperate fighting. And so you've got the story of Captain Perrin Crane and the 2nd Maryland Infantry at the Battle of Weldon Railroad piecing all of this together my working theory is that Crane, Captain Crane, in command of his Marylanders, he would have been in front. He would have been in the lead. And because his battle wound is described as having been hit by a musket with a severe wound to the left arm and left leg paralysis by being hit in the back by that musket, and the connection to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting inside the fort along those front lines of Petersburg and the Weldon Railroad makes me think that he was involved in that hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Now, more research needs to be done. That's my working theory, but that's what tomorrow's research is for. So thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.